I have with us t- tonight uh, a return guest, and this is Joe. Joe, uh, you might remember from a previous podcast, he makes uh, really cool knives out of uh, old uh, trap springs. And he has, he's also a, a retired RCMP officer, and he has a kind of a, a, a bug that he wants to, to address, and it's got to do with the Mad Trapper. And the Mad Trapper of Rat River, everybody's heard the story, and he's about to debunk a whole bunch of, of, of what we know and what we don't know. Let's uh, get right into it. How are you, Joe? Uh, not too bad, Rich. Not too bad. I uh, got my uh, coyote snaring sights uh, baited and just set snares, so tomorrow is the first check day. So. Oh, wow. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's cool. I... Uh... I haven't set up. I haven't set a snare on a coyote bait yet. I, I, I mean, I've got lots and lots of bait out, uh, and then it got warm, and yeah. then it snowed, and then and then then the snow melted, and it's like, pfft. I'm I'm doing really good on on the Martin Fisher line. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I saw I saw your your pictures there. You're uh, you're hitting them pretty good. Yeah, yeah. So lots of Fisher again this year. Strange. Everybody always says that if you trap your Fisher hard, that that you know. You'll get the population to control. Well, I have trapped on a, and a, this is my seventh year on that trap line. And I have trapped the same number of, of boxes and traps, the same amount of effort every year. And your numbers go up and down or whatever, but now they're, once again, they're skyrocketing again. So it's kind of showing that I have very little influence on, on those population le- levels. There's, a, there's other things at work that I don't know. Hey folks, Rich from Trapping Inc. TV here. And we all have our idea of the perfect morning. You know what I'm talking about. For me, the perfect morning starts with the aroma and flavor of freshly brewed Old Smokes coffee. Studies have shown that just the smell of fresh coffee can boost brain activity. No kidding. Well, that's certainly no secret to me. I can barely talk before that first cup. (laughs) Just ask Sandy. I'm a dark roast man, and Old Smokes coffee's darkest roast, stout maple, is what gets my day in gear. Extra dark, it's strong, aromatic, and smooth. Gets me revved up for whatever that day throws at me. Old Smokes roast their coffee over wood fires, the old-fashioned way. Wood roasting takes more time, much longer than modern hot air roasting. Slow roasting over wood takes the bitter out of the bean and imparts a heavenly taste and aroma from the wood smoke. Old Smokes makes a roast perfect for each person. There are five roasts, from light to extra dark, each roasted over a different wood for a unique flavor. Did you know... The darker the roast, the lower the caffeine content? It's true. Caffeine is a volatile oil that evaporates with roasting. The lightest roast has the most caffeine, and the darkest roasts have the most flavor. Right now, you can order from their online store and use our promo code RICH, that's R-I-C-H, and get 10% off your entire order. Pretty simple. Just go to www.oldsmokescoffee.com, that's O-L-E, smokescoffee.com and use the promo code rich that is promo code rich for 10 percent off your entire order and now let's get to today's show well let's get into mad trapper for lack of a not, not i don't know by any any other word um i've actually been on the rat river i've been on what was considered or the fellow that i was at said it was it, it was his old trap line what is the story? Who is this guy? Where did he come from? And uh, and what what on earth went went sideways here? Sure. Just one quick correction. Uh, Rich is I'm not retired RCMP. I'm retired uh, CBSA Immigration Enforcement, which specialized in fugitive uh, apprehensions. So. Oh yeah. Okay. Well then, you you know the dirt. The even the RCMP don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, I work. I, I worked with them constantly. Okay. And. Uh, uh, this this case was uh, quite a success story for the RCMP uh, back at that time, but it was also uh, unusual for them in that um, they this was the first time in a in a in a fugitive case they used two completely new modern things at the time: uh, radio communication and aircraft. Okay, what? date was this we kind of start kick off here december 26 1931 1931 wow that is cool to, to be using airplanes and radios then 
Yeah, and very, very new, very new. Um, of course, airplanes weren't completely new, um, but fairly new for civilian use, and also not uh, extremely well developed in the north. You know, because right. of the issues of runways and extreme cold and that type of thing. Okay, who was the Mad Trapper? What What was his actual name? Okay, as far as we know. Uh, he was Albert Johnson. The first time uh, Albert Johnson was, was really known to be around was around the summer, 1931. There was uh, a minister in around uh, Fort Mac, Fort McPherson, uh, very much kept track of uh, all the comings and goings of all of the people. And he was, he was very protective uh, of, of the native population. So he, 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 anybody that seemed different or unusual, or even just somebody new, uh, if he knew about it, he made mention of it to uh, the RCMP. The first known uh, occurrence of him being around is, is in, in the summer of, of 1931. Preacher reported a new guy in town come drifting up the river on a raft, doesn't seem to have a whole lot in the way of the typical uh, supplies and, and outfit that a northerner would have. But one thing he does seem to have a lot of is cash money, which is unusual. So it's, it's reported to, to the RCMP, Constable Millen, July 1931, uh, approaches him and asks him his name. He gives his name as as Albert Johnson. And once again, you know, giving very very little information. Um, and again, there's there's when you read the, all the different publications, which it's it's very hard to necessarily get a complete picture of what was said or what was done, um, or what information he gave. But he gave very very minimal information. Said that he'd spent some time on the prairies. Um, and that he was going to trap in the vicinity of the Rat River. So nobody knew where he came from. Pardon me? Nobody knew where he came from. Didn't say where he came from. He did not expand on it except to the effect of he had spent some time on the prairies and he was now up there and he was going to trap in the vicinity of the Rat River. Was he Canadian? That is a long story. He didn't. He didn't indicate that at the time. He didn't <laughs> indicate whether he was Canadian or or American, um, except. And and the other thing to realize too, Rich. I guess we should kind of put this in context. At that point, um, probably to everyone's surprise, the far north was a fairly busy place uh, for what it was, because there were there were uh, there was almost no paying work um, as of 1929 and into 1930. Um, one of the few ways that you could obtain funds or, or wealth um, was either prospecting for gold or trapping. Yeah, trapping was big like in the, uh, yeah. you know, the, the muskrat uh, uh, marshes in, uh, up in, uh, at Fort Chippewan that, you know, guys could make 30 bucks a day you know, catching yep. muskrats, which you weren't making 30 bucks in a month in 1930. You no, know what I mean? no, no, uh, no. One of, one of my uncles, who's now deceased, told me that uh, uh, when he was sent out from the farm to work, uh, he made a, uh, doing farm labor, he made a buck and a quarter a day, yeah. which was, which was huge. Then. Yeah. But uh, I'm just gonna, just gonna quote, um, and part of the, part of my interest in this, Rich, is that um, I've been a long time reader of the books by uh, the Karras brothers, uh, Art Karras, who wrote North Decree Lake, about oh, okay. his experiences trapping in the far north at the same time. There's another book, Child of the Wilderness, Gene Walters, who's from northern Alberta, again covering the same period of time. And then there's another one, um, North to Slave Lake, Ted. Ted uh, Morton, a game covering uh, the same time. I've and, I've read Gene's book. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. We're we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna reference some things in in, in Gene's book. Uh, quite frankly, that uh, uh, Gene's book is is part of kind of what what got me reinterested in the Rat River Trapper story. Okay. 
So nobody knows where he's come from, but he's going to be there trapping. And right. and and Constable Millen tells him if he's going to trap, he needs a license. And that's available either in Aklavik or at the RCMP detachment, although I believe it was called an outpost at the time, and it was called the Arctic, Arctic Red River Detachment, which was uh, some, dis some distance away, I'm not sure exactly. About uh, halfway between, uh, between Fort McPherson and, and uh, in, uh, uh, well, I don't even know what was in Inuvik around then? Maybe it was Aklavit just on the, because it, it's in the actual Mackenzie Delta. Right. Yeah, but and this well, is this well, is another this cross. Be more interesting, Rich, because you're familiar with some of the area that we're talking about. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. So um, that's that's the end uh, of the contact um, with uh, Albert Johnson. Um, he he does go to. Uh, there is some record of him going to the uh the store uh i believe it was in in fort mac there was i believe it was a hudson bay company uh post i'm not sure uh, if it had a different name then um and he buys uh the one thing that is known is it is recorded he buys a 16 gauge ivor johnson single barrel shotgun okay okay uh other than that at that time what other weapons he had is not recorded or um, in some of the publications, there's some mention that he purchased a canoe at that time um, because supposedly he had floated in on a homemade raft because whatever he was on had capsized. Um, it's not really clear. The, the, the story starts to become um, much more clear when there's, there's the first complaint uh, to the RCMP. Okay, so he left and, and headed for the Rat River. It, As everyone believes, yep, there was no, there was there was nothing further, no further problems or news or anything about him. Constable Millen just did kind of a cursory check, uh, didn't see anything too unusual. Told the guy if he was going to trap, he needed a license, and that was the end of it. Okay, he heads out to the Rat River, and then problems ensue. Right, um, right around Christmas time. Um, the local uh, native uh, or First Nations people of, of that area um, complain to the Mounties that this guy is springing their traps, uh, potentially stealing from their traps. Uh, I've seen it written somewhere, hanging their traps in trees, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, that's the complaint. But he never, he never bought any traps or anything like that there's no record whatsoever of him buying any traps uh, or, or, or really involving himself in trapping at all. What was he doing? I mean, was, was he actually... Was he... Well, well some, some, of the, some of the different books that have been written over the decades, Rich, are, are a little on the, uh, on the critical side uh, of the RCMP as to why were... Um, they interested in him. Why did they seem to be, you know, there's some of, some of the, the stories are rather accusatory that the RCMP were really persecuting him. And really what they were doing is they were dumbfounded by the fact that he was not there to trap. He said that he was there to trap, but he bought no traps. He bought no outfit um, that one would typically uh, buy. Um, and then he was gone. So um, the first narrative we have is, is Saturday, December 26, 1931, Constable Edgar Millen, Alfred King, and Special Constable Joe Bernard head out to talk to this guy. From everything that I can tell, from everything that I've written, it's what we would call in modern law enforcement terms uh, a knock and talk. You know, you've got a complaint, it's not a super serious complaint. There isn't necessary, necessarily plans for an arrest. 
uh, you've got a complaint and you need to talk to the person to see what their side of the story is. Okay, so they have had no contact with them to this point. They're just going out to knock on his door and say, you've been complained about right. and try and mediate a solution or whatever. Right. Yep. Okay. So they go out there. It's noted in every, in every, in every different publication that I've read is they know that he's home because there's smoke rising from the chimney. There's some of the different publications that I've read, some but not all indicate there was a little window in the cabin. And when they, when they knocked on the door and announced who they were and they needed to speak to him, they saw him look out the window briefly. The looking out the window briefly is a little bit inconsistent, but what is consistent is they knew he was home, they could hear him moving around, uh, and there's smoke coming from the chimney. And he won't answer. So him not answering is is also uh, a huge red flag, because at that time uh, in the north, um, there was uh, there was sort of a, um, a system, if you like to call it, that uh, the northern trappers and northern travelers always stopped in on each other whenever they were passing by. Um, and it was considered, you know, the height of rudeness not to come to the door and invite the people in. Yeah, it would be odd. I mean, it's, it'd still be odd in the North here. So uh, in this yeah. day and age. And, and again, when you read these other, these other publications by, by fellas that trapped at that same time, they, they really articulate in detail. That was, that was the way of looking out for one another uh, in case somebody was sick, hurt running out of supplies, anything like that. Um, and it also, it also was, was very much uh, designed to prevent what has been pitched as a key element in the whole story of the Rat River Trapper, keep people from going a little stir crazy from being alone too long. Well, that's just it. I mean, you might only see one person or right. two people in, in, for the vast part of the year, you know, other right. than, than when, when you went to town to, to sell fur or provision or whatever. I mean, that's, that, that's just the way the life was. My grandpa had a, had a trap line here in the North and uh, he would uh, leave uh, first of October and it was 70 miles. He went by foot and he had to cross uh, uh, the Smoky river and he had to cross uh, the Simonette and he had to cross the, the, the Moose river. And he would come out at Christmas and he'd come out with whatever fur he'd got on his back and by then he'd be on snowshoes wow. and then he would, then he would go back after Christmas and, you know, like the next day or whatever, he would, he would go back after having sold his fur and that, and he would come out, he'd have to come out the, in the spring uh, ahead of uh, breakup so that he didn't have to try and, you know, build uh, or to try, try and cross those, those rivers and that when ice is uh, coming down or when it's in spring flood. So yeah, it, uh, he, it was it was a, a different life than what we live today. Like <laughs> there, the communication was, you, you know, people talk about how sometimes it's it, they begin to wonder if if they can actually talk or not anymore, you know. And so so they sit there and they and they talk just to make noise in their in their cabin, you know, right. to prove that they can still talk. <laughs> well, you know, on on that on that topic, Rich, one of the things that that um, has to be discussed is. Uh, part of the job of the Mount of Police at that time in the North was very much to look out for and or screen newcomers to the North. Yep. Because as you can imagine, with things just being in desperate circumstances down South, people would then hear of untold riches in gold and furs, et cetera, et cetera, and then come to the North in the summer months with plans for prospecting, trapping, et cetera, et cetera, and just be woefully ill-prepared to make it through the winter. And once again, when you read some of the other books by the old timers that went north, um, when they would check on each other or when they would check on maybe somebody they didn't know, um, if that person needed to be taken out, uh, or, or taken to civilization, uh, quite often it fell on the Mounties to do it. Yeah. Oh, I, I remember my grandpa talking about uh, 
uh, Smoky um, Smoky Mike, and he he was a trapper and he lived uh, he down on the Smoky River and he had a had a place there. Um, they had to do somehow they in the middle of the winter they the, the, the RCMP got the uh, word that he he was in in trouble or he'd been sick. Could have been. Yeah, he he he'd been sick anyway. So my grandpa goes with him because they didn't know how to how to find the cabin. My grandpa did, and that was like thirty five miles one way on, on snowshoes. And I mean, it's not like there's roads you're snowshoeing on. You're you're going through the woods, right? You think about that. Think about thirty five miles one way go, going through the woods, you know, and 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 yeah. finding your way and and that kind of stuff. And I can hardly find my truck in the parking lot with my GPS in my hand. <laughs> and you know they. They go and find him, and what had happened is he he uh, fell, broke his leg, and he. I'm not sure whether he was he was actually had starved to death or if he was freezing to death, but he ended up shooting himself in in his cabin, laying in 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 his bunk bed. Wow. Yeah, because that's, that, that's where they found him. His leg was broken, and and like grandpa grandpa said, there there was no wood in the in the cabin and mm-hmm. that kind of stuff, you know. And back in those days, you know. Life was pretty tough, and yep. you you burned a lot of wood every winter. So, so did did word come out perhaps by somebody else that was close that hadn't seen him in a while? Or, or I'm or trying that. to remember. There was something like that. It was like and then there was another guy, Cat Bradley, but I think Cat Bradley died of a, of a virus. But Grandpa went there too, and it's funny because they were both on the Smoky River. Cat Bradley was a remittance man, so he uh, was. He was uh, uh, an embarrassment to his family back in England. Mm-hmm. And so they sent him to the colony, right? Yeah. And he would get so much money or whatever. And he um, uh, she did a dairy farm, if you can believe this. Back then, in, in, in the, this was, would be in the 30s, he had a dairy farm. They, they cleared, I don't know, maybe 80 acres, like along the river and, and that uh, uh, on the Smoky River. And he had this dairy farm and he had a... Um, like a, a steam paddle wheeler and he would go down to Byzantine, I like which is where I get my mail but the old Byzantine town site was on the Smoky River and he would uh, come down that river one, once a week with with milk and butter and that from his from his dairy cattle and pick up his remittance check and all that and go back and he had a had taken a um, First Nation lady as as his uh, his bride and back in those days that made was even more embarrassing for the for the folks back in England and all, but he was by all means a very uh, very well to do fella and and uh, was doing very well. But he, I think they both died of some flu or some virus. Could, Grandpa had to go in for that one too, but I don't remember. I don't remember him talking about about his wife. I, I remember Cap was was and he built like a two story cabin, like he had a two story cabin, and I was it was fascinating. But I mean and. Tough, tough, tough. I look at those people and it's like, oh my God, they were tough. (laughs) So, so Rich, you you used an interesting term. You're one of the few other people that I've that I that I've ever heard use the term remittance man and understand what it means. Because I dealt with a number of those in my career. You did you? Yes, yes. Even even in the modern modern age. Yes, yes. Because you, you, I would be dealing with with foreign nationals that were here um and 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 once once again the the it's because they're behaving oddly or doing something odd that usually would bring the uh bring it to the attention of local police or some other form of government and once again it was almost always what is this person doing here you know yeah. and how on earth do they live well, um, I'll say it before you do, uh, a remittance man, or it could be a remittance woman, um, is a person who uh, comes from money or wealth, but is an embarrassment to their family yeah. back home. So they're sent abroad to some other country, and the term remittance comes from the continual money that the that the family back in the old country sent. When we were talking in the Anglo sense of the word from England or Ireland or whatever, where and most of this is English, um, the remittance man was just about invariably was the eldest son, but he was an embarrassment and was not going to do a proper job of carrying on the the, the family tradition and the and the family. 
a business or whatever. So that was the way they got rid of, because normally everything goes to the eldest son. And that was, that was the way they got rid of that eldest son was they shipped them off to the colonies, which is what we were. And, and uh, you know, they sent them a, a stipend every now and then, you know, monthly or weekly, whatever it was to keep, keep them here. Right. Uh, they're just hoping, you know, they're, they're, they're pushing off their problem on somebody else and hoping that he died somewhere else. But that way they, it, and it, it was, it was, you know, I mean, they were, their society was set up that this was quite acceptable that, you know, we didn't, I mean, hereditary law was everything, unless we could get rid of him, you know, he could take some money to go somewhere else and then son number two or number three can, can take over. Right. <laughs> right. And, 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 right. And, and especially, you know, in, in way back in time, um, when places like England, you know, had a very sort of staunch set of, of expectations and, and societal rules, uh, the person that was shipped off as the remittance man sometimes was not all that bad. Um, the family just thought it was better that they were gone somewhere and we'll send money and, and please go off to the colonies and do whatever you will there. Some, uh, some of them had it. Like uh, Cap Bradley had a problem with uh, with the bottle. Yep. And his he, the, the, the stories of, of when he'd go on a tear, you know, Mm -hmm. every week he'd be be in the summer and that he'd be down to to Byzantium to to drop off his milk uh, and cream and all that and you know for the first little while people would sell him booze and then he'd be going a tear for a week and and then of course his cows weren't being taken care of while while he's down there drunk and everything so they learned not to not to give him give him any uh, or sell him any any booze but there was a lot of of uh, like uh you know unrequited love where they you know the the true born heir uh, fell in love with the scullery maid. And of course she was beneath him that kind of thing. And, right, right. and but he wouldn't, wouldn't uh, knuckle under to dad. And so off you go, you know, <laughs> they sent a lot of them here to Canada. They sent a bunch to India too, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yep, but the, but the, uh, the, 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 the idea of, of remittance of, uh, you know, there's, there's a number of different cultures uh, around the world too, that uh, today that have fairly, fairly strict, you know, expectations um, uh, of, of people. And when the, the folks aren't, aren't meeting those expectations, yep. sometimes it's easier to just send them abroad and send them money and, and hope that whatever they're doing uh, can be, you know, better to embarrass themselves somewhere else. Well, yeah, well, then it doesn't, if it's in the colonies, it doesn't ever get back, right? <laughs> <laughs> back back to your story we wandered down a, off on a tangent here yep. okay uh yeah and so we're touched on remittance man because it, we'll, we'll probably get back to this later when people are are desperately fishing out around for who on earth was uh albert johnson but on the tw on the 26th of december they go to the cabin uh knock on the door just for a chat um it is reasonable to believe that there was not really any intention of anything more serious or they would have sent more people. Um, in fact, I believe the RCMP members expected to be uh, back home in time for big New Year's celebration. Okay. But Albert Johnson will not come to the door, uh, which is unheard of uh, at those times and will not communicate. So, they head back and they um, contact their inspector. Hey folks, Rich from Trapping Inc. TV here. And we all have our idea of the perfect morning. You know what I'm talking about. For me, the perfect morning starts with the aroma and flavor of freshly brewed Old Smokes coffee. Studies have shown that just the smell of fresh coffee can boost brain activity. No kidding. Well, that's certainly no secret to me. I can barely talk before that first cup. <laughs> Just ask Sandy. I'm a dark roast man, and Old Smoke's Coffee's darkest roast, Stout Maple, is what gets my day in gear. Extra dark, it's strong, aromatic, and smooth. Gets me revved up for whatever that day throws at me. Old Smoke's roasts their coffee over wood fires, the old-fashioned way. Wood roasting takes more time, much longer than modern hot air roasting. Slow roasting over wood takes the bitter out of the bean and imparts a heavenly taste and aroma from the wood smoke. Old Smokes makes a roast perfect for each person. There are five roasts, from light to extra dark, each roasted over a different wood for a unique flavor. Did you know 
The darker the roast, the lower the caffeine content? It's true. Caffeine is a volatile oil that evaporates with roasting. The lightest roast has the most caffeine, and the darkest roasts have the most flavor. Right now, you can order from their online store and use our promo code RICH, that's R-I-C-H, and get 10% off your entire order. Pretty simple. Just go to www.olsmokescoffee.com, that's O-L-E, smokescoffee.com and use the promo code rich that is promo code rich for 10 percent off your entire order and now let's get to today's show yeah it, it, I, I find it um uh, intriguing that there were search warrants in 1931 <laughs> I, think, I think we all thought they just walked up and kicked the door in <laughs> The thing about that, the thing about that, and, and, and those things did happen, Rich. The problem is uh, when, those, when, when that was done um, and later on there was uh, somebody went to trial or somebody ended up dead, uh, then there would be questions asked as to, you know, what exactly were you doing? So they got their warrant and they headed back to go talk to him one way or the other. December 30th. Uh, the warrant is issued this, uh, Thursday, December 31st, 1931. Uh, they arrived back at the cabin. Very important to mention this fellow's name, Special Constable Lazarus. He's, he's a, a First Nations uh, tracker, scout, Special Constable with the RCMP, and he is with this, this situation the entire time. And, okay. Yeah, and uh, if there was ever anybody that should be glorified um, you know, it's, it, it's a fellow like him. Anyway, so there's also Constable Robert McDowell, Constable King, Alfred King. So there's three of them. Yeah. Okay. So they knock on the door. I, I don't know exactly what words were said, but um, some sort of words to the, to the effect that he, Alfred, or sorry, uh, Albert Johnson needed to come out. He needed, they needed to talk to him. Uh, they are answered. Uh, whereby Albert Johnson shoots Constable King right through the door. Really? One shot with a 30-30 rifle, dead center, and Constable King crumpled. Did it kill him? Uh, it didn't. He goes down, and uh, the other two fellows open fire on the cabin, and Constable King... Uh, is able to crawl um, a short distance. They get him into the dog sled and head for help. And and how far it was taking a day to travel? So, what what was how far would they be, be traveling uh, back to Fort McPherson? Here's the thing. Here's the thing. They could go back to Fort Mac, but here's the thing. There's no doctor and no hospital at Fort Mac. They've got to go to Aklavik, 120 kilometers away. Yeah, yeah. Because when we came out of uh, Aklavik uh, and we went south, and we probably went 65 miles south mm -hmm. out of, uh, and so we and we ended up like north, north northwest of. Uh, Fort McPherson, and we were on the north end of uh, of uh, where you could cross over into the Rat River. We were actually the side of the mountains that we were on was actually like a high plateau, okay. and it was just basically down into the Rat River. And the fellow said that uh, we were actually uh, a little bit south of where the cabin was supposed to have been, and and all that. But uh, it, it's a very different country. It's a very different country. Yes. So they then turned and they headed north with, with an injured man in the dog sled. Yep. Yep. And um, uh, I can't remember the exact number of hours, uh, but uh, they, uh, Constable King was ble bleeding profusely, shot right through the chest. And uh, I believe this uh, story is they ran some of the dogs right to death to, in order to get him uh, to, uh, to medical attention. And um, this, uh, there was, uh, I, think, I believe, Dr. Urquhart is, is uh, he, he ends up saving a number of lives. And I believe he was uh, an old army surgeon. And um, 
he operates and and saves Constable King's life. Travel up there is all on the Delta. Mm -hmm. So it's all on ice. And, mm -hmm. you know, when you drive from Inuvik to uh, Aklavik, you're on in this Mackenzie Delta, and it's about two and a half hours at, at more than the speed limit, which is what I was doing <laughs> in a truck on, on on an ice road. But then when we when we left there to go to the to the trap line that you travel on all there's uh, like I mean if you think of a root ball, uh, you know like the roots on a tree and that yeah, if, yeah. that's what that that is like. There is just so many different rivers and and channels and they, only over. I don't know how wide it would be. Uh, it would be hundreds of kilometers wide. And then of course, hundreds of kilometers long. So mm -hmm. even when, when we got to where we came off of, uh, off of what was still part of the Delta, you know, we'd, we'd come down 65 miles from, from uh, uh, Klavik. And then we, we got up, uh, up on the bank away from the, the river and that in order to go over to, to where the trap line and that was so they that's where what they would have been traveling on they they had been on the on one of the, the tributaries or whatever in that in that delta in that system right um and 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 so what you just described rich is going to later on at the very end uh play a critical part in in how this ends now um do those do those waterway systems uh, tend a lot of times to uh, very uh, sort of uh, oxbow and circle almost back on themselves at times? And you have islands and and you know like I mean sometimes you think that you're you're following a, an individual river, and and you're not, you know because it's all part of this this huge vast network, right? Um, same thing when when you get up into the up in the the north. Um, East corner of, of Alberta on, on the, uh, the Athabasca. Same thing. You have, the, you know, you think that you're, this is a separate individual river, but then you come around a corner and then another, and another rivers come in. You've been just traveling for, you know, 30, 30 kilometers or, or three or four kilometers by a long worth of an Island. You know what I mean? And there are right. oxbows and there are tur right. turnoffs and all that kind of stuff. It's, it's very, very complex. Um, yeah. I had my GPS with me and, it had just had a background map of the of, of the world kind of thing, and but even to look at it there, if if you wanted if you want to get an idea, take and, and go on Google Map and uh, zoom into that area. You're going to be astounded at, at how how large it is, how complex it is, because you know you you always think about you know when we have a river here, when the Simonette runs into the smoke or whatever, it just runs in, right? It might be a might be an island or two there, but that's the, that's it. This is a whole different thing. All right. Well, I know exactly what you mean, Rich, because probably about oh, around 2000, uh, I shot my first moose um, north of, of just north of Pine House Lake uh, with my RCMP buddy on the Holtain River, and the Holtain River um, crosses. Uh, the road or highway there, and you can basically, it, it's a great way to hunt moose because you can put in upstream and just float down the river uh, with the motor off completely quietly, and off to the sides will be all of these swamps, and hopefully you'll float up um, on a moose, which is exactly what we did, uh, which is great, except that on the map, it looks like there's maybe about eight kilometers between where the river uh, flows out and then crosses again. Um, but it twists back on itself uh, to such an extent, um, it's more like 40 to 50 miles because it, it follows such a snaking route. And at times, as you're floating down, you can look back and see where you came from. Yeah, yeah. And this, only this is, uh, this is just over a gigantic area. Like, I mean, it's hard to describe you. You'd have to have to actually look at it on Google map, but the, the Mackenzie Delta is something else. Mm -hmm. So they get the fella to uh, a clavic. Right. And the doctor keep, saves his life. The doctor saves his life. At some point, uh, there's, there's a note in, in one of the publications that I have. Um, at one point as he's recovering, he's saying that, oh, he thinks there's something in the, in the, uh, fold in a sheet or something that's poking him in the back and it was a spent bullet um, and 
don't know for certain if that's if that's true. Um, however, Constable King uh, did survive and he did recover. Okay, good. So um, at this point, this has now become really serious. Now they've got to dispatch a big team of, of people. They, they called out for volunteers, trappers, volunteer, Joe Verville, Carl Garland, John Moses, uh, and then they, and then they also tapped into uh, the Royal Canadian Signal Corps, which is the Canadian military, were up there, and it was um, Earl, uh, Quartermaster Earl Her Hersey, and um, RF Riddell, Frank Jackson, who's now a trapper, and anyway, there's a number of different, and of course, these guys are selected partly for their knowledge um, of the area. Right. Okay. So they have, they have quite a, quite a crew then. They do. They do. Okay. And, um, and once again, Lazarus. So they all head out um, and they're going to deal with this guy. Um, and um, aside from, and so there's, there, I can't remember how many dog teams there are, um, but everyone is obviously armed and they've also got, some dynamite. They arrived there Saturday, January 9th, 1932. Um, so they go there and, and also Inspector Eames is with them. They uh, surround the place. They order him to give himself up. Um, you, we have a warrant. You're, you're wanted for murder. As soon as um, the policemen and trapper volunteers and First Nations people come within range, Albert Johnson starts shooting from within, within, inside the cabin. So why was he wanted for murder? Uh, well, I guess it should be attempted murder. Yeah, okay. Attempted okay. murder. Okay, uh, and he'd, he'd stay there at the cabin all that time? He'd stay there at the cabin, and, and everybody, and there's, there's always, uh, there's, there's speculation, and nobody's entirely sure uh, why he would remain there um, when you'd think that all, virtually anybody would know <laughs> that they're coming back and it isn't going to be good. So he's, he's shooting from uh, inside the cabin from what appears to be uh, gun ports uh, at the base uh, of the cabin. And this, this is a pit cabin. So there's, there's a fair bit of the cabin. There's only about four feet or thereabouts sticking up above the ground. Yep. And, there, and then there's a foot or more... Um, uh, that's dug out inside and, and so we can talk about this now or later but there's a, a really huge deal made of this pit style cabin okay and what's that well uh, virtually almost every publication that uh, I read especially way back and I, I should start from the beginning too rich when I was young and I knew I told you my story last time when I started trapping when I was nine years old and I I started catching muskrats and mink and I was so into trapping. And so then you look up in the public library, uh, trapping, and what does it come to? The mad trapper of Rat River. Yep. And uh, so as a kid, it, this is not only fascinating, but it's, it's a little bit horrific. I mean, the, the pictures of Albert Johnson uh, deceased are, are, are not pretty. I know. <laughs> I, no. If you ever drive the Dempster Highway mm -hmm. to Inuvik, so uh, from from uh, uh, Whitehorse, uh, uh, um, you go back uh, to Dawson Dawson City, and uh, just before Dawson City, you, you're taking your head north on, on the Dempster Highway, and it goes to Inuvik. And about halfway through there, there's a place called Porcupine uh, Plains, and no, pardon, not porcupine, eagle planes. Mm -hmm. And it's up, it's up really high. And then after that, you take and you drop down and then you're into the uh, Arctic Ocean uh, influence. And that's when, when the winds blow, it blows really bad down there. And that, that highway all gets closed all the time. But when you're there, there's a bar there and there's a, a hotel. And because lots of times the highway gets closed, that's where the gates are. So it's kind of a captive audience. They have the story on the walls. And they have a picture of him, you know, several pictures of him propped up with the bullet holes in him. And that he's obviously dead. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it, you know, it, it's, it's crazy to, to, to think about that happening. And, and 
it's even for me what makes it even stranger is that they had that that kind of technology that they could take pictures in that back then and there right. in the north you know that it just right. seems kind of incongruent that 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 those that that went together but mm -hmm. continue on with your story i interrupted <laughs> well there's there's a there's a great deal um and then this is kind of this is kind of why i'm interested in talking about this uh there's uh, now this is this is not from the official rcmp notes or archives or this is from uh, this is from the many different books and publications that were written in the past number of decades. A great deal is made out of his bunker-like pit cabin that must have been built uh, absolutely for this type of thing um, uh, to be able to uh, you know have a shootout and survive, et cetera, et cetera. Well, but they were they were really common, especially there, because for one thing, I mean, it, it, what, when you dug down into the ground, you know that, that that was that was great insulation. Another thing was that meant that meant less trees that you needed to build walls, and there's not a lot of trees there. <laughs> the fascinating thing, though, Rich, I guess what I'm getting at is most of the world doesn't know that, right? And even myself, as a kid reading this growing up uh, at the farm and I remember asking my dad and my uncles and they just said no 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 sane person did that because on the prairies or you know in, in, in farming country you either had trees and you built a log cabin or you had or you or you were in a place where they and, and they built built the sod cabins yep. uh, which they quickly got rid of as soon as they could get wood but but and it's partly because um, down here, um, everybody's keen on digging until they hit that gumbo about a foot down. Yeah, very different country there. I mean, it's either very muskeg different. or it's rock. Very different. And, and the average person, Rich, I think is, is this is very important. Uh, when I re read these, the different publications of the Cross Brothers and Morton and Gene Walters, and even your interview with... Um, who was the older fellow that, that you did a, uh, a, uh, a, a, a podcast with? Alan. Alan, Alan, yeah. Alan Purdy. Right. They talk about their first either cabins or uh, sometimes you can't even call them that. They're, no. they're, they're just a shelter. Um, anyway. And so, so the average person, Rich, I don't think has any appreciation for the fact that where you might want to build your cabin there's going to be a dist distinct lack of straight trees in order to build that cabin. And I don't think, and as well, I guess, Rich, uh, um, I, I, I can just reference this. Part of what made kind of spurred my interest was about a decade, well, maybe not 10 years ago, is I bought the book Child of the Wilderness by Gene Walters. Right. Have you read I've, I've read that one, yes. Have you seen the picture on the front? I've got it here somewhere. It's probably on my <laughs> shelf. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's Gene Walters standing at the front door of a cabin, and guess what kind of cabin it is? Oh, it'll be, it'll be uh, I've been dug in, yeah. It's a pit cabin. Yeah. Du because, Actually, they called them dug. They, the, the common term here was a dugout cabin. Right. And, yeah. and, but it's, it's one of those things that the average person, especially from southern, from down here, um, Digging, you know, you know, it's a really hard thing. But when you read these fellows, they explain why they did that. Well, in the right place in the far north, as you would know, it's just soft sand. Yep. Yeah. And I mean, and it's insulative. Right. It's, it, and it's airtight. Like, right. I mean, I don't care how good you are chinking the logs yeah. in, in a cabin. You, the, the still breezes still get through you. It, it is not near as, uh, as, as good a wall as, as the, that dugout is. Plus the fact that if you can if you can dig it down a couple feet, right. then that's two less feet that you got to try and scrounge up logs for. And and exactly. I mean I've been up there. I've I've seen what there is for wood. You'd be hard put to you know like a, a twelve by twelve cabin would be a major accomplishment. Absolutely, absolutely. And and when you when you read these other publications, the guys talk about the 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 selection of their site um, where where they where they would build their cabin or build their shelter. Um, and, and again, it was almost always, uh, at first a dugout cabin. 
Um, yeah. and, um, and, and the other thing is as well too, when you when you read these stuff and you, and you, and you, um, and, and you truly understand the way things work, um, because early on there were no registered trap lines, it was not always as, as, uh, as, as the old fellow you interviewed indicated, it was not always wise to spend a ton of time and effort on a cabin if you didn't know that you were going to be there for future seasons. Yeah. Why? Okay. Hey, Rich here. Sandy and I are pleased at the rapid growth of our exclusive community, Trapping Inc. at Locals.com. We created the community to connect more closely with our fans, friends, and supporters without the interference and censorship of social media companies. Because this community is subscriber exclusive, there is no censored photos, shadow banning, and deplatforming, as happens on Twitter and Facebook. Trolls are non-existent, as not a one will spend a nickel and put their money where their mouth is to protest on a paid site. You know it. We are steadily moving all Trapping Inc. YouTube videos and podcasts as quickly as time and bandwidth allow. We're tickled and surprised to see how large of library we must move. As well, we are sharing articles on trapping and guns and shooting. Our new TV series, Married to the Hunt, videos are here too. Hours and hours of never before released to the internet hunting and fishing from around the world. Trappinginc.locals.com will be the exclusive home of all Trapping Inc. content from the past and into the future. What else is there to do? Well, there's a forum for everyone to post pictures on and interact. You can message us directly on trappinginc.locals.com as well as interact with all the other subscribers. These are all people with common interests. Get in here. This whole venture is about taking the Trapping Inc. TV community to the next level, building a community of shared interest and interacting with all of our friends. Who knows where we can go from here? Just go to locals.com and sign up for a free account. Then search for Trapping Inc. and subscribe for $5 a month. That's it. Go to locals.com to open a free account and then subscribe for $5 a month to Trapping Inc. Help us spread the truth about a way of life and the responsible, ethical management of the wild resources. Trappinginc.locals.com. Now back to the show. Jim. 